Good morning. I uh, hope you guys are enjoying the week so far as it's the first day. Yeah, good. Glad to join you on the start of your week. Um, this morning, you know, as we kind of begin our, our Holy Week journey and, and, and begin to move towards Good Friday and Easter Sunday, I want to talk to you briefly about um, the time between Jesus' gracious, when you were talking about his love for us, you know, they, they call it, in, in my Bible, it's called the triumphal entry of our king. You know, but the more I think about it, it's just the more the, the gracious entry of our king. His willingness to come in on a donkey, his willingness to come to redeem us, to come and to save us, to come and, and to die on the cross that we might have eternal life. It's just, it's just the grace is overwhelming. And as you were talking about his love for us, that's just what uh, kept rolling over and over in my mind is, is the gracious walk that Jesus was willing to take on your behalf and my behalf. But this morning, I want to focus a little bit uh, just briefly on what happens a little in between uh, his triumphal entry, that gracious walk in, and then his crucifixion on the cross. I, I believe there are, there are three main points that Jesus, for me at least, uh, points out for, for the power of living. You know, he didn't come just to redeem us. He didn't come just uh, so that we could have eternal life. He also came that we might live life to the fullest here and now. Not that we just kind of pass through this life and, and go on to eternity, but he wants us to live to the fullest here and now. Not only does he want us to live that way, but he wants to move through us that way into other people's lives. And as I was reading this account and, and walking through uh, the account over and over, there's three things that really point, uh, stuck out to me when it comes to um, Jesus giving us keys for the power of living here in this earth, and then I think even particular just now in this season. And the first is um, Jesus' first stop after uh, the triumphal entry. Does anybody know where his first stop was after the triumphal entry? Church. Yeah, he went to church. Is that everybody's first stop when you get into a city is church? Oh, you can answer that yourselves. You don't have to tell me. It's okay. His first stop was the temple. So he had just walked in, and his first stop was the temple. And it's, we're going to read in the Matthew passage. It's Matthew 21, 12. Matthew 21, 12. It's his first stop. Jesus entered the temple courts, and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of all those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Then the blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked him? He said, yes. Have you not read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and he went out to the city of Bethany where he spent the night. Right here, his first stop, he goes in and he cleans house at his house. And he, he sets forth the precedent of the most important thing in his house is prayer. It doesn't say you need to have the best worship team, which we do, right? Or the best preaching, which in most cases we do. He says, my house will be called a house of prayer. You know, Second Chronicles says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. You know, that's the promise. When we pray, when we talk, when we call on God, he promises every single time to hear us and to respond, to hear us and to respond. And he's telling us here, as, as he walks in, as he's walked down and he's, on his, his, he's gotten off his donkey and the palms are behind him, he's saying the most important thing you can do is gather together and pray. That that is the base of his, his house. The, the core of his house is to gather together and pray. And when we begin to pray, we begin to see things change. I know when, I, when I'm frustrated, I often forget to pray. And then it takes me, you know, a couple of days and I realize I should just be praying about this. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as I begin to pray, a couple of things might happen. One, the things in my life change and things get sorted out. Two, at the very least, I get the peace and the grace and the wisdom to walk through whatever it is that's going on in my life. He grants power when we pray. He, he speaks into our lives when we pray. He moves on our behalf when we pray. And he says, first thing, first stop, my house will be called 
a house of prayer. One of the keys to powerful living, to living in the full power and the fullness of who God is, is to gather together to pray. We're, we're called to pray as individuals. We're, we're, we're called to pray in our prayer closets. But it, he's talking here, my house, my people, my church are called to gather and to pray. We want to see things change. We want, we want to walk in, in wisdom. We want to walk in power. It starts right here with us gathering together to pray. It's incredible. It's the, the power of prayer. The next thing that God really showed me is the power of love. A little later on, we're going to actually switch to Mark, the Mark's account. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Jesus begins to talk about the power of love. So we have the power of the prayer and we have power of love. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them good answers, he asked him, which I, I find quite fascinating. This guy's, okay, God's giving good answers. Jesus is giving good answers, so now I can come ask him. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, he answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no command greater than these. Well said. <laughs> nice of him to compliment Jesus on his answer. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is the more important than the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any questions. You know, we, we talk about this often, the Ten Commandments and, and, the, and the two most important commandments. I'm sure this is not super revelatory for you about what those are. But for me, it, Jesus is taking the time right here in this moment as he's preparing to go die on the cross, as he's walking to, to go and take the beatings and, and to die and to rise again. Knowing that all this is coming, he's, he takes the time to answer these questions. He takes the time to meet with these people. But he takes the time, most importantly, to remind us the most important thing we can do in this is to love God and to love one another. To love God and one another. And in fact, when, when the guy answers him back with the same answer Jesus had given him, he said, you are close to God. You are not far from God. There is something powerful about being loved. There is something powerful about being loved. Think about it for a second. In your own life, maybe in your, in your family, in your relationship with God, there's security that comes with being loved. The Bible says that there is no fear when it comes to love. There is power in being loved. So that means there's power in loving one another. There's power in loving God. There's power in moving in that way. That's how relationships stay solid. That's how relationships are built, and that's how relationships grow. That's how barriers are broken. When you meet somebody that is hurt, that is lost, that is broken, that is sad, that is depressed, that is angry, when you begin to love on them and have compassion on them, you begin to see those walls open up. Think about all the hard times in your life. When somebody steps into your life and begins to show you love and you haven't changed a single thing about your life, there is power in that. When you receive that from somebody, when you receive that from God, when you receive it knowing, hey, I I haven't done anything different. This person has just decided, I'm going to love you. There is power in that. There is power to break chains. There is power to open up doors. There is power to release people from fear and depression and anger. When you begin to show love, especially the love of Christ to those around you. So first God comes, Jesus comes, and he tells us, we've got to be people who pray. And then he says, you have to be people that love that love God, and that love one another, that relationships are important. And the third one is this. We find it in John. John chapter 13. Real famous passage. This is when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. I'm going to read the whole passage to you real quick. It says, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. So he knew 
his time had come to an end. It says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God, and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing. He wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that is wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus said, you don't realize what I'm about to do, but later you will. No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. You are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew he was going to be betrayed, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Right here in the middle of of the, well, right here near the end, I guess, of Jesus' life, when he's getting ready to, to go onto the cross and to die for our sins, he takes a moment to teach us what true humility is like. The power of humility. One of my favorite verses in in this whole entire thing is it says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So, he knew who he was. He knew that he had been given all power and all authority. So, this is what he did. He washed their feet. The power of humility. You know, Jesus has has bestowed an incredible amount of authority and power in our lives. In Luke 10, it says, You have been given the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power. To overcome all the powerful things. He says, You have been given this power. He sent them out in power in, in, in Matthew 28, but yet with that authority, Jesus takes it and serves. Jesus takes it and says, I am going to show you the best way forward. He says, now that I have showed you, it would be good if you did the same, that there is power in humility. Think again about relationships that you walk in and, and, and people you come across and, and, and those people in your, in your, in your family and, and, and maybe in your life that you know are just so humble. That they're willing to do whatever it takes. They're willing to do anything and everything for you. And it's not from a place of, I am weak. It is a place of, I know exactly who I am. This is what he told him. He says, you call me teacher, you call me Lord, and rightly so, because that's who I am. And being that, this is the way that I am going to move forward, and that is to serve. God calls us to be people who pray to gather together, to pray, and to move forward. He calls us to love one another, to love him, and he calls us to be humble, to be willing to serve anywhere and everywhere. It's interesting, if you kind of flip forward a little bit in John, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, he begins to speak about the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm fully convinced that if we can grasp a hold and put our hearts and our minds in this place of being willing to pray at all times, being willing to love at all times, being willing to serve at all times, that we open up ourselves to the move of the Holy Spirit in our life and through this world. You put your heart and your mind in a place to be able to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, to be able to use the power and move forward in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit moves, it is often to pray. It is often 
to serve. It is often to love those who are unlovable or those who have not been loved or those who you don't want to love. But if we can condition our hearts and condition our minds to this, the Holy Spirit has the freedom to move. At the end of 15, John chapter 15 says, When the advocate comes, the Holy Spirit, who am I? Whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And also, you must testify. Later on in 16, it says, when he comes, he will prove, when he comes, he will prove to the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. It's interesting, often we want to prove, right? Right? We want to prove the world wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. It says that the Holy Spirit and the move of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit will do that. If we try to do it, I guarantee you if we try to do it on our own, and you won't walk in the power of prayer, you won't walk in the power of love, and you definitely won't walk in the power of humility. You ever tried to correct somebody under your own strength? Say, you know, go and point out all the things they've done wrong. Has that ever worked out really well for you? No, not that we don't, not that we don't have those opportunities, not that we're not called to. We are definitely called to. But if if we don't do that through the power of prayer, through the power of love, through the power of humility, it just becomes us bashing people. If we walk in those things and the power of and, and, and the gifts that God has given us, the Holy Spirit will begin to work on people's lives. He will prove them wrong. He will show them the redemption that they have before them. But it's our call and our responsibility to move in those things. We have all the power in the world to come anytime we want in this place and pray. We have all the power in the world anytime we want to love our neighbor as ourselves. We have all the power anytime we want to walk in humility to those around us. I want to challenge you in a world that is moving quite the opposite. In a world that is, is, is saying that you've got to do you and you've got to move forward and you can do whatever you want. To walk in prayer, to walk in love, and to walk in humility. You know, Jesus, I, I said it last week, Jesus was not a do as I tell you. He was always a do as I show you. And this is what he did. When he went to the cross, it was in full obedience. He had been praying, right? He he. When he prayed, God said, nope, this is what I have for you. And he moved in that because why? He loves us. And he was humble, humble all the way to the cross so that you and I could be here, so that you and I could have redemption, so that you and I could have peace, so we could have freedom, so we could be set free from the sins that we have in our life, so we could be forgiven and redeemed and restored. And he's done it for everybody. And it's our opportunity, and, 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 and especially in this season, to move out in that. So I just ask this week to be conscious, to pray. Every Wednesday, every Wednesday, people come here to gather together and pray. Consider joining in your small groups. Take extra time as a group to pray. In your micro groups, take extra time to pray, to love one another, to love your neighbors, and to serve them to the utmost so that we can see the Holy Spirit move in our life and in our generations, in our generations to come. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your love. Lord, I thank you for your love and in your obedience to the Father to walk into that city and riding on that donkey so that we may be saved, so that we may be redeemed, so that we may have eternal life, so that we can live full lives here and now. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us will be obedient to gather, to pray, that we be obedient to love you and to love one another and we will be obedient to walk in humility. So that we may see the power of the Holy Spirit move in our lives and those lives that we come in touch with. Lord, I thank you for your grace, for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.